Ovidor Seglane, nestled in the rich and fertile French countryside on the banks of the River Glane, located just over 10 miles from the region's capital, Limoges. Ovidor was connected to the city by a tram line, which made several journeys a day. The village population was just over 300 prior to the war, but with the intake of refugees, this had soon increased. Livestock and fresh produce was generous in the village. The hotels, cafes and restaurants served up high quality meals which attracted business from the surrounding areas. Old St Martin Church was known for its intricate architecture and the adjoval vaults shouldered the four columns of its structure. Although located in Lower Town, its spires could be seen from all corners of the village. The morning of Saturday, the 10th of June 1944, four days after the Allied invasion of Normandy, villagers started gathering in the town. People arrived from the surrounding areas to buy food from the market. Local farmers came for tobacco distribution. Lunchtime had passed and many of the visitors started to make their journey home. The village was slowly returning to normal occupancy. At around 2 p.m., there was the sound of heavy vehicles approaching the village from over the bridge. Around 200 soldiers of the Waffen SS Panzer Division Das Reich, under the command of Major Adolf Deutmann, rolled into the town. A few residents who had previously been displaced by the Nazis made an early escape, fearing what might happen. The rest of the village looked on, confused and worried. Once the convoy reached Champ de Foire, the village fairground, most of the soldiers got out of the trucks, working their way through each building in the village. The German soldiers instructed all men, women and children to go to the village centre, proclaiming they were there to check identity papers. A systematic search of all the houses was next, forcing everyone, even the sick, out of their homes wearing whatever they had on at the time. Children were attending school that morning, helping to make decorations for the church fete that was on the Sunday. Soldiers burst into the schools, ordering everybody outside. One boy hid and managed to escape when it was all clear. It was just before 3 p.m. when everyone had been gathered. The Germans separated the men and the women. The men were split into smaller groups and led off different locations. The Bouchelet barn, Millard barn, Lowdy Barn, De Sato Garage and the Bailu Workshop which were all guarded by machine guns and rifles. The women and children were escorted into the church, young children crying holding on to their mothers. In the barns and buildings the men huddled together wondering what their fate might be. Soldiers guarded the entrances with machine guns and rifles. 4 p.m. An explosion was heard signalling the German soldiers to open fire. The machine gunners sprayed from left to right with a hail of bullets. Soldiers went through the bodies, executing anybody still visibly alive. They placed wood and hay over the bodies and set them on fire. Many of the men were still alive, shot and wounded, dead bodies lying on top of them. The sound of muffled moans and screams. 5 p.m. The Germans turned their attention to the church. They set off an incendiary device, exploding and filling the church with thick black smoke. As the women and children attempted to escape, they were gunned down without mercy. One woman, Marguerite, managed to escape through the church window, followed closely by a woman clutching her child. As the child cried out, the Germans were alerted and they opened fire. All three were shot and only Marguerite survived. The town was next. Homes and businesses were looted and set on fire. In a matter of hours, the vibrant town of Orador had been reduced to ashes. Only one building remained, that of Monsieur Dupec, the local draper. His house was well stocked and the Germans spent the night there, drinking bottles of champagne. The following morning when they left, the building was also set on fire. In all, 643 people died at the hands of the SS Panzer Division. To combat the Allied invasion, Major Adolf Dieckmann and his division were ordered to go to Normandy, where he and most of the division died in battle. Shortly after the war, 
General Charles de Gaulle declared Orador should never be rebuilt. Instead, it should remain a stark memorial to Nazi cruelty. The hundreds of victims of this tragedy would be remembered with the honoured distinction, died for France. So leaving the car park, the main entrance to the massacred village is via the museum. Once you're in the main entrance, you are faced with a lot of visual displays. You're taken on kind of a history lesson, a journey, showing you about the Nazis, how they managed working their way through France. You also then learn about the French resistance, the part they played, how they recruited people, how they brought in ammunition to the small villages. And then it leads on to Ovador Seglane, where it shows you the people from the village, the different types of background, the lifestyles they had. As you work your way to the end of the museum, you're faced with a long corridor, and this corridor is what leads to the village. But as you walk down this corridor, on both sides is a wall filled with tiles. But on these tiles are pictures, and these pictures are the people who died. And it's amazing to see the parents, grandparents, children, babies, all looking back at you. It kind of brings reality to the story where you could actually, you can visually see these people's faces. And from these photos, you can kind of tell what type of lifestyle they had, you know, how well groomed they were, the type of clothing they had, what kind of class they were in. Every now and again, you will come across a white tile with just a name on. And these tiles are for the people that there was no photograph available for. And just the reality of seeing these pictures, it really brings it, it brings a story more to life, seeing the faces looking back at you. And it's a big thanks to Robert Pike through reading his book and speaking with Robert, um, which allowed us to use some of these stories from the book. Reading their words and just imagining what it was like, it's just horrific. The story is horrific. We're just glad we can get some of these details and visually tell the story to the viewer. A lot of people have heard of the story of Ovidor Seglane, but not many are aware of some of the more in-depth details and the actual testimonies from the survivors. Two years we'd been waiting to come to Ovidor Seglane, but it was a complete shock to what we did experience there. Originally, I was going to talk whilst videoing in the village, but the, the truth of the story and the feeling and the atmosphere when you was there, I was literally lost for words. So all I could do was really film the houses and the village. And it was at that point I then realised that I may need to narrate this story. So you enter the village and it's quite a long road before you get to the main village. You can still see on the buildings, the scorch marks around the windows. You can see the effects the fire had on the inside of the buildings to the walls. And a lot of the buildings have plaques on the outside telling you what that building was. There's still quite a lot of artifacts inside the buildings and these are genuine from these properties. They are not props what have been put in there. These are the actual remains of the buildings. I mean, just seeing some of these artifacts in the buildings to think these people use these day in, day out. It was part of their lives. And in some of the rooms, you can even still see the twisted bed frames where these people slept.
quite a few buildings that have remains of their cars left where it is now just the shell and the chassis sitting there. There are plaques on the buildings where people were killed and it's these plaques with the red writing and that's um, the identification that this is the building where the men were brought to when they were shot. But looking down the street you can sense the life what was there and now it's just a skeleton of the village left. This is the Champ de Foire which was the village fairground. This was the main gathering place where any fates or fairs the villagers would come together. This was the area where the Germans had rounded up all the villagers and where the men and women were separated. From this point is where the women were led to the church and the men were split into their groups and taken to the individual barns. The car still sits in front of the pharmacy and is often referred to as the doctor's car but this car was actually Dennis, the wine merchant's vehicle, which was later brought to the village square. As the people gathered in Champ de Foire, there were rumours circulating that the Germans were there to make requisitions. A familiar car rumbled down the street. Dr. Jack de Soto, son of the mayor, and the town's other physician. He pulled up nearby, having completed his rounds in a nearby village. He had been at the birth of a child in the nearby hamlet of Le Chart. Jack got out and joined everybody else. Here we are. Avador Siglan. This is the centre of the village. What a place. What a very, very special place. Tell you what, not very, very often lost words, but what a place. It's dead here, what can I say? I'll describe it. It's a bit eerie in a way, there's hardly any birds around anywhere. It's as if they're keeping away. But just walking through all these ruins and trying to imagine what it was like as a populated village. Unbelievable. What's going on here? These places need to be remembered for years and years and years. The temporary building that housed the class for refugees had been built from cheap materials. Their teacher, fearful of stray bullets, took his pupils into the infant's classroom next door. The walls of the former presbytery were made of solid stone. Roger Godfrey was a pupil in the school for refugees. Crouching down, he did not see the soldier who burst in and beckoned their teacher to bring the children. As the classroom was evacuated, the seven-year-old did exactly as he had been told by his parents. The German army had expelled them from their homes in the Moselle region four years earlier. He had been told that he should fear the German army. I remembered what my mother said one day when we were sat at the table. If we saw the Germans, we should run away into the woods. Roger's sisters, 12-year-old Marie-Jean, and 11-year-old Piriette were there too, 
and I told them that we had to save ourselves by getting away from the Germans, but they did not want to follow me. I slid away quietly, and seeing no other Germans, I hid in the garden behind the school. I took a path towards some woods by the glade. I ran very quickly, and I lost one of my sandals, the left one, but I did not stop to pick it up, because I knew I did not have time. I went through thorns, but I did not stop to think about the pain. Before the woods, I saw the baker, my father's boss. He was with a lady, a refugee from Lorraine. I was probably there for about five minutes, but then I saw two Germans on the other side of the bush. They were armed with machine guns. I thought if I stayed, I would probably be killed quickly. So I made a run towards the woods. The grass was high, tangled between the toes of my bare left foot because I had lost my sandal. I fell over. The two Germans had seen me trying to escape and I saw them laugh. Another German who I had seen was stood near the cemetery when he saw me. He whistled to me, but I ran away as fast as I could. They chased after me, but I got to the other side of the river by wading through the water, which only went up to my knees. On the other side, I hid behind a tree. The Germans left me alone for a minute, so I headed back towards the woodland. I crouched down behind a tree. I saw them fire a folly of bullets towards me. Roger looked up to see that the bullets had killed a dog called Bobby that had followed him as far as the edge of the river. A little later, Roger was found by road worker Pierre Gabriel who took him to the household where the family cared for his wounds and removed the thorns from his feet. Armand Senan watched on as the men were grouped. I saw four groups of about 50 men and they were led one after another, each guarded by armed Germans carrying rifles, machine guns and light machine guns. One of the groups was led into my father's barn, just about 40 metres away from where I was. In the Lodi barn, Robert Hebras was not panicked by the firing stance adopted by the guards. Yvonne Roby was feeling anxious as he watched. Roby, who lived well outside Orador, felt like something of an outsider as groups slowly gathered, so he pushed himself further back. The soldiers told one man who tried to sit down to get back to his feet. They waited for half an hour or so, and all the while Yvonne Roby could not take his eyes off the soldier fiddling with his weapon. He really caught my eye, Beginning to fear for my life, I slowly moved myself out of the line of fire. Then several officers approached the barn. Joseph Bergman turned white. They are going to kill us, he spat out. The apprentice barber was a German speaker who had spent much of his life living in Strasbourg. His friends did not know he could understand the SS. We suddenly heard what sounded like the firing of a cannon, said Jovan Roby. It could have been the sound of a tank's gun. There had been a tank near the Champ de Foire. That explosion, which was loud but not close enough to make the barn shake, seemed to be the signal for the shooting. Next came the sound of machine guns firing, which according to Matthew Borry, seemed to come from the garage. Immediately, the soldiers yelled out, and on the brief command, the six Germans discharged their arms onto us. Roby had moved far enough back into the crowd and towards the open room's extremities. This probably saved his life. I was last to be shot. Seeing the men at the other side of the room fall, I had the presence of mind to throw myself down to the ground, flat on my stomach, turning my back to the Germans. The bullet screamed in from everywhere, ricocheting off the wall next to me. The splintering of mortar and rock covered me with dust. After several rounds of machine gun fire, I could no longer breathe. I was suffocated by the dust. Matthew Borey also threw himself to the ground and played dead until nobody else showed any sign of life. During the onslaught, villagers Brassaudier had dived to the ground and also did Darth out. He was hit during the first round of fire by two bullets, one in each calf. As he went down, Two further bullets hit his thighs. 
Whether he dived or was knocked down by the impact of the bullets, he had no idea. In several seconds, I was covered with bodies. During the shooting, Robert Hebrus moved back into the crowd, immediately dropped to the hard floor. He was injured in a knee above his left breast and five times in the right wrist. Two further bullets had grazed his left side of his forehead. The bullets had passed through the others and by the time they reached me, they no longer had the power to go in deep. As Jean Marcel lay collapsed on the ground, I listened to the cries of the injured. It was not shouting, but muffled gasps. I was smothered underneath the injured, flattened out and covered with blood that was pouring out of the other men. One of the villagers had to hold himself still as one of the soldiers stepped on his ankle. A friend was laid across my chest and his blood was soaking me. I heard the breech of a gun click as it was armed and then a muffled blow. The injured man atop of me was then killed. I felt his shudder, tremble, then nothing more. Yvonne Roby lay trembling under a pile of bodies as the soldiers looked for dying men. The injured were crying out, howling, some calling for their wives and children. Seeing this, the Germans, who were wearing heavy boots, climbed on top of the bodies to finish them off with a revolver. Personally, I was injured in the shoulder by one of the gunshots of the men's bodies who was lying on top of me. This is what saved me. I was hurt at the same moment that the injured man laying on top of me was exterminated outright. Somehow, I managed to continue to simulate death. The soldiers set about the task of covering the bodies with whatever combustibles they could find. First, they spread hay and straw from the barn. One of the Germans was using a steel pronged fork and I could hear it sink into the dead bodies beside me. Next, the soldiers threw on bundles of kindling wood, followed by another layer of straw and twigs. Rails from carts, logs and a very big ladder, and even a wooden crate thrown haphazardly on top of us. One crate smashed into my head. I remember the shock of that for a lifetime. Once finished, the executioners left the courtyard to receive new orders. The soldiers were away from the carnage for about 15 minutes. During this time, Darthout heard sounds suggesting others were alive. Despite severe pain, Darthout attempted to change position as not to suffocate under the weight of the bodies. I touched the hand of the man next to me. It was Monsieur Aliotti. He told me that his legs were broken. The two men said that the Germans were going to burn them, but Darthout reassured him, telling him that they would get out. Marcel Brissiord was the first to speak audibly. He already had an artificial leg after having lost it in the First World War. My other leg, it's gone, he groaned. The soldiers had fired low and then high. Brissiord's leg had been all but severed. Men were dying, some managing to lift their heads through the straw, all soaked with blood. The soldiers returned to Lowry Barn, talking loudly amongst themselves they took several moments to release livestock that was tied to the buildings. Then, the sound of striking of matches signalled the start of the fire. They threw a powder onto us which must have been sprayed, given the noise from the machine it made. The fire spread rapidly, and Darthout decided he would try to escape the heat. I could feel fire licking my hair, and trying to protect my head with my hands, they too were burning. My clothes caught fire, so feeling the flames around my shoulders, I called to my comrades for help to get out. Matthew Borry, suddenly aware that there were no Germans guarding us, freed himself from the stacks of wood by using sticks to push the burning wood away from his face. He stepped over bodies in order to get out of the barn and onto the courtyard. I saw Santrot Senior and Brissaud Senior begin to burn. They had been down there beside me, still alive but too injured by bullets to move. I spoke to them and they told me they could not move and that I should flee. I tried to resist for as long as I could by protecting myself behind the bodies of those who were already dead. At the rear of the barn, a small door promised an escape. He was surprised to find that it opened. 
stepping over bodies and shielding himself from flames, he went into the main courtyard. From there, he heard voices and footsteps in the alleyway that led to the back of the Champ de Foire. It would be folly to walk into the path of the same soldiers whose gunfire he had just escaped. Instead, he traced his way through the thick smoke to the stables that had not been used. Putting open one of the doors, he slid into a dusky murkiness. As his eyes adjusted, he saw a human figure on the other side of the stable. Panicked, he shot back outside and hugged the wall as he made his way around the outside of the structure. He heard hushed voices. The words were French. In a gap between the buildings, he found Brasordia, Bori, Roby and Darthout. Three of the men were carrying injuries, but Darthout looked particularly badly hurt. Understanding that the barn and its adjoining stables would burn, I got straight to it. I set to work, alone with a view to getting out of there. Armand Senan had witnessed the roundup, the departure of the women and children towards the church and the partition of the men into groups. He had also seen the last group of men outside the warehouse. I heard the shooting coming from the barn. It lasted several minutes. As soon as it had finished, the Germans went into the stables to release the livestock. Not long after the shooting at Dydown, he witnessed the arrival of a group of seven or eight men accompanied by Germans at the Champ de Foire. They made those with bicycles lean them up against the building. They then made the civilians line up in front of the building's forge. And from a distance of 10 metres, one of the men fired at them. I could see the executioner in front of the hostages. He shot along the row in a sweeping motion. The men fell straight to the ground. Then I watched as he aimed his gun towards the ground and he continued shooting at the civilians. Dust was whipping up from the ground. The bodies of the victims were then added to the others already in the Bailu Forge. Armand Senan understood at that moment that the Nazis were killing all of the village's men for a reason he never fully understood. He made the decision to struggle down to the Champ de Foire and give himself up to the soldiers. I was going to give myself up in order to be shot, just like the others. But when I got to the Champ de Foire, in front of our house, I could see no Germans anywhere nearby. So I decided to hide in some bushes behind the house. My leg was in plaster, so I had to crawl along the ground, dragging my leg until I got into the undergrowth. Hubert de Sato had lost all notion of time as he waited in the dark of his incomplete garage extension. From the garage space, just through the door, as my brother normally parked his car, there had been machine gun fire, 10 to 15 minutes in duration, almost without pause. I heard no human cry and I had no concept of what had happened. De Sato did, however, hear the many single shots. After the shooting, the Germans came into the building where I was hidden. They did not go into the room where I was. When they saw the building was unfinished and empty, they went straight back out, but they had not quite finished. They climbed up into the garret. I could smell gasoline. No doubt, my hidden store had been punctured. I heard someone scattering something, and afterwards, he found it had been charcoal thrown on the corpses. A little later, around five o'clock, he smelt smoke and very quickly became overwhelming. He heard the crackling of flames above him. He went out to the garden where he crouched in a small courtyard amongst the walnut trees. I understood just then that the whole place was in flames. I watched alone as the village burned. Later, he could clearly see flames rising from the steeple of the church. The centuries-old church, small and dimly lit, was packed with women, school children, toddlers and babies in arms or in prams. The pews clogged up what available space there had been. After the march down the main avenue, they had passed the old oak tree that stretched out next to the market hall. The outer doors had been locked. Before we knew it, it was full of women and children 
school children and toddlers of all ages were squashed up close to their mothers. As time passed, we were told nothing. As the wait went on and on, many children whose parents were in the surrounding villages had the female teachers as their sole source of comfort. As the noise got quieter, Marguerite Rufange looked around and found her family members. I found myself reunited with my two daughters and my seven-month-old grandson. I watched as my little niece, who was five years old, slept. Almost 250 women and over 200 children were packed into a space designed to hold no more than 350. Most, however, felt safe in the sacred place. Occasionally, one of the two exterior doors would crack open and a soldier would look inside. Little was audible from the village, but the crackle of gunfire seemed more and more sporadic. Marguerite Rufange and her family waited anxiously in the packed nave of the church. After an hour and a half, the Germans opened the door and started to empty that part of the building of people. Some women and children were put outside. Two Germans, to age around 30, forced a gap between the women and children and brought in a box about a metre long, which they put down in front of the communion table at the far end of the nave. It must have been heavy because it took two of them to carry it. It had lots of white strings hanging out. They put the box onto two chairs. Marguerite, standing nearby, could see inside it when it was opened by the two soldiers. Soon afterwards, the Germans left, without having said a word to us and without seemingly having to give us a second thought. This time, the men left via the small door in the chapel. Marguerite was alarmed by what she saw. I found myself imagining that they were going to blow up the church with us inside, but most people remained calm. Outside in the square, Adolf Dietmann stood arms crossed while his second in command, Otto Kahn, directed operations. Marguerite would be the only witness to what happened within Oridor's church. Several moments later, a muffled detonation came from within the box, and before long, a black, acrid and burning smoke began pouring out of it, filling the entire church. That smoke was asphyxiating, so women and children began screaming and crying for help. Everybody was panicking and trying to get clear. All of the school children were there with us, including the 13 and 14 year old boys. What made the panic worse was the lack of space. There was nowhere to get away. At that moment, people were climbing over each other, whole families, school children, not to mention mothers carrying babies. Marguerite led her family towards the only place that she could think of. I found some fun protection from the asphyxiation near the sacristy where I sheltered with my two children and some neighbours. The sacristy door was locked but the strength of dozens including Marguerite forced it open. The room was small with a wooden floor and benches around the outside. Wooden steps led down to a storage space with a door to the outside where soldiers had gathered. Marguerite knew that their only chance of survival would be to stay still and hope that the soldiers did not look in. She pushed herself into a space at the top of the steps where she crouched alongside her youngest daughter, Andre. Her other daughter, Amelie, held baby Guy close to her and found space in the other side of the sacristy. The screams and shouting were getting louder, which must have annoyed the Germans who unleashed bursts of machine gun fire through the windows of the sacristy. Once the suffocating gas had killed most people, soldiers entered by the main door and fired on those still alive. They sprayed bullets, firstly in the direction of the chapel, where scores of people had gathered trying to get to the smaller second exit on the other side of the building. The shots killed anyone still alive, splintering the plaque which commemorated Orador's 99 soldiers from the 1914 to 1918 war. The bullets were fired into the sacristy from the nave as well as through the windows from outside. Marguerite could only watch as Andre was shot through the neck, dying instantly. Marguerite frozen with fear, lay down and played dead. Incendiary grenades were thrown into the main church and then through the lower door of the sacristy, creating a furnace below. Marguerite, unable to move for fear of being shot, could only look on as explosions brought down the floorboards of the sacristy 
and all those hidden inside, including her eldest daughter and her grandson, fell directly into the furnace below. More than half of the people were burnt alive. Miraculously, Marguerite, curled up in a sacristy of the church, had not been hit by any bullets. Lying as still as she could and holding the hand of a dying woman, she could just make out what was happening in the nave. Soon after the firing had stopped, some Germans came inside the church. They brought in straw and firewood and turned over the church stalls and chairs. They then set fire to it all. Two men brought firewood to the doorway of the sacristy, which threatened to block my path. So when they went to get more, my instinct for survival made me act. Using the pyre and the smoke as a hiding place, she ducked behind it and headed toward the only part of the church with large windows, the eastern wall behind the altar. I noticed a stepladder, usually used for lighting candles, and I got up onto it and I opened one of the windows, the one on the left hand side. I threw myself through it. Marguerite had managed to find a window made of reinforced glass and a lead frame, which had already been blown out by one of the grenades. She forced her way through and fell three metres onto a steep bank below. A neighbour, who was a mother of a small baby of around seven months, followed me through the window. She tried to pass her baby to me, but I was unable to catch him. Hearing the bullets all around me, I got back to my feet to find shelter in the garden. My neighbour must have been killed as she was getting out of the window. Margaret's escape had not gone unnoticed. She staggered around a steep grass verge, trying to reach the presbytery. I got as far as the peas when I was shot five times in my legs. I was also shot in the shoulder. I felt my shoulder blades splitting, so fell amongst the vegetable plants. The German soldiers assumed that they had killed her. The houses were in ruins. Windowsills still had pots of flowers on them, but there was rubble all over the pavements. Cooking pots hung in fireplaces, and coffee pots stood on the corners of stoves. The core of each house had crumbled, and every house was ruined. I kept thinking that it was like a nightmare. I thought I would surely see a house that was intact, someone alive or a familiar face, but no, it was just ruins and more ruins. When we went into the village, it was still in flames, and the heat was hardly bearable, so we had to walk quickly. Near the home, we found two bodies, carbonised, and small enough to suggest that they were the remains of children. Jean looked into the Desato garage, where we saw many bodies, some still just about recognisable. Among them, he recognised his son, Maurice. The previous night, Madame du Charlotte had stood in a ditch opposite for about an hour. She had wanted, at all costs, to go into the village to find her little ones. Her body had been found alongside the road at the entrance to the village, and shot through the head. The first thing I saw was smoke pouring from the bell tower, which was missing its top. He made his way through the wreck of the village. Many buildings were smoking and some still burning. He got to his father's shop around half past eight in the morning. I had the key ready, but there was no door left. There was nothing. The Germans who had remained in the town overnight had already begun to dig communal graves for the bodies, not totally consumed by fire. Later that morning, men and women he knew and who lived nearby began to arrive. Robert Besson and Jack Gourard, they returned to the spot where they had hidden and where young Roger Godfrey had briefly paused before running for the woods. Near to the wall where we hid, we found the body of Baker Thomas and refugee Delstein stuffed into a wheelbarrow. During their search, they also found the corpse of Pierrier Poutrard, the garage owner, tangled in a fence on the side of the lane towards the cemetery. Had Poutrard survived his escaped attempt, he would have been faced with the death of his wife Rennie and six of his seven children, all under 12 years of age. Only one daughter survived because she was staying with her grandmother. Poutrard was the seventh male to escape the barns, but unfortunately he did not survive. Rene got to Oridor at around 10 o'clock. 
but seeing three trucks parked up underneath the trees at the bridge into the village, he decided it would be wise to take a detour. He hid his bike under the bridge. Bicycles and motorcycles that had been thrown onto the banks and into the waters of the Glane were strewn everywhere. He also saw the body of Marcelin Shallard, the tram worker, which was thrown into the river from the bridge. René first went to his grandmother's house, which was still standing. Smoke was starting to pour through the roof. I went closer to see what was happening. The doors and windows were wide open and furniture had been ripped apart. In the kitchen, in front of the window, I could see alongside a bicycle and the trap door that led to the cellar, the body of my grandmother. Her body was partially covered with the belly of a cow. He then went to the church. I was met with the most horrific sight. Inside several metres from the main entrance, I saw the body of a woman laid out, completely unclothed. It looked as though her clothes had caught fire. Further into the church, about four or five metres in, he saw the pile of bodies, around one and a half metres high and two to three metres in diameter. The whole thing was a reddish blaze from which smoke billowed. You could still definitely make out the forms of the bodies due to the skeletal structures. Other bodies, mainly children, were half burned and strewn across the nave. He went further into the church where he saw two children, both shot dead and their legs intertwined. He wanted to separate them, but he could not stand the thick smoke and the nauseating odour which was suffocating him. Before leaving, he saw the floor of the sacristy had crumbled and that below fire was still blazing. At two o'clock in the afternoon, Arthur Senamood finally went to Orador after managing to wait for the word that the soldiers had left. He saw human remains and charred remnants of animals all along the main thoroughfare. Inside the church, he saw the same horrors of those who had gone before. The left alcove was the confessional box, which must have avoided serious fire damage because the box, though scorched by heat, had stayed standing. Inside were the bodies of two boys, sitting with each other. Their bodies were not damaged by the flames, their faces only lightly blackened. One of them was sat, back face to the nave. He must have been around 12 years old. The other, a little older, was sat facing the church in a crouching position, arms pressed down on his thighs, face looking towards the floor, with his head falling forward. There was nobody in the priest's side of the box. Many of the children in the church did not live in Orador and were from the surrounding hamlets. Most of the parents still didn't know what had happened and were frantically worrying where their children were. Marie Hyvenord talked and decided that the children must have been put with their teachers at a safe distance from the fire. They were sure that they would have been looked after and that they would have their children return to them before sunrise. They waited impatiently all morning and received no news. In the early afternoon, word spread that the women and children had been in the church when it was burnt. They still did not want to believe, nor could they allow themselves to do so. Finally, word reached them that one of their sons had been identified in the church. The couple left for the village, numb with fear. They got there at half past four in the afternoon, accompanied by several neighbours. They found the body of eight-year-old Marcel, laid on his side. It certainly was my little one. His mouth was open. He seemed scared. His foot was broken and twisted around. I was still able to give him a kiss. Jean and Marie wrapped his body in a small bedsheet. They could not find the body of their oldest son, René. Later, they buried Marcel using a coffin that Jean built himself. Villager David waited until the evening, then went into the village, passing a little way through the town. He went to the home and shop in the lower village. Within the destroyed flat, he found a metal bed frame, under which were the remains of his sister. He wrapped her in some bed linen and buried her in a vegetable patch that his father had been renting near a house in the woodland. More people came into the village to look for their loved ones. Jean Currivaud, who had been one of the very first into the church on the Sunday morning, returned at around half past one on the Monday. 
I went into the church where I saw the burnt bodies. The evening before, the Germans had been in and made most disappear. In particular, those bodies that were not entirely destroyed by flames. They had buried them in a ditch next to the church. On Monday morning, Marshal Mashafa and his friend, Amy Forrest, went to the village to see if they could find survivors or to help in any way. When they got to the church, Mashafa showed his friend where Marguerite Rufange had been found the previous day. While there, they noticed that the toilet next to the vegetable garden and behind the church had not been burned. Thinking that there could be somebody inside, they went in. At the back of one of the stalls, they found the body of a baby wrapped in its swaddling. The baby was a boy and had received mortal gunshot wounds. Leonard Ledote was worrying about her husband and feared for the safety of her daughter Marie, her granddaughter Henriette and her great-grandson René. She made her way to the village when somebody had approached her and told her the news that she had been dreading. Earlier in the day, she was told the body of a baby had been found and it had been identified as seven and a half month old René. She made her way to an area beyond the church where the baby's body had been laid out. She recognised the child at once and immediately sought authorisation from the town's new mayor to take him away for burial. She also found the body of her own mother, 78 year old Francois, covered with the cow belly and with the help of members of the Red Cross, she arranged for her mother to be recovered. Later she was told that her granddaughter Henriette's body had been found in a shallow ditch near the toilet block where little René had been discovered. Their brave escape attempt was later confirmed by Margaret Rufange. Lenard was also able to identify her daughter, mother of eight, who was found just inside the vestry of the church where the burning floor had crashed into the cellar. Lenard had lost another six grandchildren that day. Her husband, Marshall, she learned, had been shot and burned in one of the execution barns. Nothing could have prepared Camille Sennan for the days that followed the massacre. She went back into the village to help where she could, as a massive recovery and clean-up operation began. Those few days were terrible, with the exception of the church and the barns, the places of execution were not known. They only found those by going from building to building in an effort to find human remains. The people from the surrounding villages, particularly the parents of school children, were coming to try to find things that had belonged to their children. Pieces of clothing or where bodies had fallen one on top of the other and not completely burned. Bodies were found in the well of the Peacats farm, but they were not identified. Similar bodies were found in the oven of one of the bakeries. The charred remains of a baby was also found in a metal dustbin. On many of the signs and plaques and literature, it's been reported that there were 642 victims of Ovidor Seglain. In January 2020, Spanish grandmother Ramona Dominguez Gill was pronounced by the Limoges High Court to be the 643rd victim of the massacre of Ovidor Seglain. She died alongside her daughter-in-law Marina and her three grandchildren in the church. Very few people remained from the village following the massacre and they simply did not know the Spanish victims that well. Most of the bodies in the church and the barns had been reduced to cinders and were unrecognisable. there's two paths you can take to get to the cemetery. One path is from the church and you go past the Elodie barn and the other path is walking through the Champ de Foire. And just before you get to the steps to the cemetery, there is the crypt which goes underground where you can go and look at the artifacts. Now inside this crypt is a lot of the items recovered from the buildings and they've all been brought here and displayed in the glass cabinets. Mm -hmm. 
So you can see things such as people's glasses, the Swiss army knives, scissors, children's toys. There's items from the school, what they used. And you can also see there is a pram in there, which has got bullet holes and shrapnel from the grenades covered all over it. On the walls, there is engraved all the names of the victims. It's a very well presented area, looking at all these artifacts, and you work your way around the room, and then there's like a, a centre part to the room where there's more articles on display there. It's absolutely fascinating walking around, looking at all the different things that belong to these people. And just past the crypt is the entrance to the cemetery, where you walk past a lot of all the graves and tombs there. Now, a lot of these graves and tombs here were people from the area. They wasn't necessarily the victims. Uh, most of the victims, they were just cinders of ash. There wasn't a lot left of them. And as you walk to the far end of the cemetery is the area where all the names have listed of the victims from Orador. They're all on the plaques on the wall. Uh, everybody's listed there. And then around the walls, you can see all the tributes to the family members and the children. And then you have the large column, Tewa, the tomb tribute. There was one story what stuck in my mind and Robert Pike mentioned it. It's not mentioned many other places and I know there's no images or anything like that. But it was a story uh, just after the massacre when people were going into the village to help with the clear up. A mother had found the hand of a little girl and she said, this is my girl's hand. I know it is. It is definitely my girl's hand. And what this mother did is she kept the hand and took the hand home with her. So to think that was a, I suppose, her only treasure left of her little girl was this charred remains of a hand. And apparently the mother had kept the hand with her for two years. I suppose of that was a comfort of that was holding on to the last you know, the last physical thing of her child. Um, but apparently after two years, she did take the hand to the cemetery. And just in front of the tomb at the cemetery, there is two glass coffins on the floor. Now it's quite common in France um, for bones to be on display. And in these two glass coffins are just the small remains of bones, what was left. As we said, most people were just turned to ash, but the few bones what was left, they were in these glass coffins. And apparently, the mother had placed the hand in one of these glass coffins. And as the story played on my mind, I wanted to see if the hand was there. When I got to the glass coffins, I looked in the first one and you could see bones and you could tell that was like bones from a leg. And then I looked in the second glass coffin and then right there, sitting on the top, was this little hand of a girl. I was just lost for words when I saw that hand. And the closer I looked, you could see the fingers were bent back and you could see the long nail on one of the fingers. And it was the mother who said, I knew it was my daughter's hand because it was pristine. So I'd imagine this girl had like very delicate hands with very well looked after nails and it was there, I was just amazed. And that vision I think is the one thing from visiting that village that will stay with me. And it's a moment I will never forget. After the war, the massacre of Orador Seglane also received a great deal of attention. In 1946, 
the French government declared the site to be a national memorial site and mandated its conservation. The French prosecution team presented documentation of the killings at the International Military Tribunal in Nuremberg, 1946. In 1953, a French military court in Bordeaux prosecuted 21 former members of the SS division for crimes committed at Orador Seglane. 14 of the defendants were ethnic Germans. The court convicted 20 of the defendants. It sentenced two to death and the rest to prison terms between five and 20 years. Amnesties and pardons, however, freed all of the convicts, including the two sentenced to death within five years of the trial. In 1981, authorities in German Democratic Republic arrested and prosecuted Heinz Barth, a former SS sergeant and platoon commander whose soldiers were among those who shot the men of Ovidor Seglane. An East Berlin court sentenced Barth to life in prison. Released in 1997, Barth died in 2007 at the age of 86. The courts could not come to any conclusion of the reason why the soldiers had massacred everybody at Ovidor Seglane. Many stories over the years have had different theories that it was resistance, it was because a German officer was kidnapped, because a German soldier was shot in Limoges. But none of these theories has ever been confirmed and no paper trail was ever found evident in the German army. So to this day, it is still unknown what the real reason was Orador was massacred. So Robert Hebres, on his last birthday was 96 and he's now handed the baton over to his granddaughter, Agatha, where she will now continue the work with Ovidor Seglain as Robert has spent most of his life telling the story and educating others. Marguerite Rufange, the only female survivor from the church, sadly passed away in March 1988 at the age of 91. She did not leave the Oridor area following the massacre and when the new village was built in the early 1950s she moved into that village and spent the rest of her life there. When she was buried on the 25th of May Robert Hebras called for a minute silence at the graveside said that it was very hard for when we carried her to the cemetery we carried all of them. Provenance Political belief, age or religion made no difference. The priests were killed, babies were killed, old men and women were killed. Parents who had come to the village to look for their children were killed. Cyclists just passing through on a Sunday ride were killed. Shoppers from Limoges, only in the village because they were desperate to find food, were murdered. So our journey, all in all, was over 1,400 miles so we could get to Ovidor Seglain to see the village, to experience what had happened there. From all the research we had done and knew of the story, we wanted to go there and walk in the footsteps of Ovidor Seglain, to think families had built lives there which were completely lost. Children never had the opportunity to build a life. It, that was taken away from them never experienced having their own family. That's the sad reminder of this village. So much was lost and so many lost the opportunity to ever have a life. Ovidor Seglain is a story that needs to be taught in all schools, in all countries, so these atrocities aren't allowed to happen again. <laughs>